All right. Hello, everyone. We are now live on Zoom and on Facebook. Thank you so much to everyone for joining and those who are, are tuning in through other platforms. Um, I'm very, very thrilled to welcome Rose Gottemoller to the European Leadership Network to discuss her new memoir. She's currently Zooming in from sunny California. My name is Sahil Shah, and I'm a policy fellow at the European Leadership Network. Um, Rose has kindly agreed to speak to us today about her brilliant new book, Negotiating the New START Treaty, which was published this month by Cambria Press and is already available for electronic download and will soon hit the printers if you prefer a hard copy. Rose is someone who quite frankly needs no introduction, so instead I will take the opportunity to congratulate and thank her for taking the time to provide the world with such a thorough and illuminating account of how we arrived to New START. The former late Secretary George Schultz, someone who we both had the pleasure of knowing, greatly admire, and miss, said it best. This book is important, but not just because it tells you about a very significant past, but also because it helps you understand the future. I could not agree more. I was heartened to see that Rose has opened the book with a set of acknowledgments that starts with the advice that Secretary Schultz gave her when she arrived to Stanford in early 2020 and told him that she'd be writing this book. His advice was simple, tell a story. After having a chance to read an advanced copy of the book, I know how proud he must have been of your storytelling skills. The memoir is an intricate yet accessible, personal yet deeply intellectually intriguing account of a story that Netflix could certainly turn into its next political thriller. In the spirit of Secretary Schultz, who often used stories from his career to pass on lessons to the next generation, we at the ELN have invited Rose here today to do exactly the same. As a next generation reader myself, I can say that the book has highlighted to me that when we talk about treaties and the wider institutional scaffolding of our past, current and future arms control and international security architecture, at the end of the day, it comes down to the individual thinkers, negotiators and leaders who breathe life into them. In short, the people matter. The memoir sheds light on the fact that while it is indeed imaginative, exciting, and rewarding work, it is also sacrificial, soul-bearing, and often enormously difficult work. It requires traits that not many can embody all at once, diligence and determination, focus and ferocity, and in my, in, in my opinion, most importantly, creativity and empathy. So Rose, on behalf of all of your colleagues and friends, I wanted to say thank you for your service, not only to the United States and the Euro-Atlantic region, which the ELN cares so deeply about, but also the international community. Your new book is a gift that many can and will learn from for decades to come. And I'm so pleased that you are here to join us at the ELN for today's discussion. The floor is now yours for some opening thoughts. Oh, thank you so much, Sahil. And uh, thank you indeed for mentioning George Schultz. When I first arrived at Stanford, I was, uh, you know, really fresh from being the, the Deputy Secretary General at NATO. And to be honest with you, and I know there are many European colleagues and many NATO colleagues on, on this uh, call today, uh, I was, you know, thinking about this book in the back of my mind while I was DSG and really reflecting on the experience of the negotiations now over a decade ago, it's hard to believe, but 2009, 2010. I was reflecting, and so the book had a long gestation period. And really, I think I used the time as, as often happens in a creative process, just to let uh, the thoughts develop and the memories develop. And it was really important uh, to let those memories uh, come to the surface again, because honestly, I was mentioning to Sahil, I'm not a devoted diarist. I didn't keep a, a journal during the negotiation of the treaty. I did have great help from the State Department Historian's Office, who uh, provided me many uh, notes and, and cables and background materials uh, from the historical record to look over, and that was extremely helpful. And I had my great team uh, from the delegation, both the senior members, whom I acknowledge at the front of the book, but also uh, a number of, of the younger members of the delegation would sit down at various times and hash things over. So they were a great help. But the book really took some time and reflection. And it's not a typical negotiator's memoir in that it doesn't go blow by blow at the negotiating table, but really tries to tell the complete story from beginning to end, including 
um, the, the start of my career and how I landed in that position in the first place come 2009. It did have, from that perspective, uh, a long lead time as well because I worked on the start delegation as a very young State Department uh, staffer in, two, uh, sorry, in, in 1990 and 1991. So um, it's, uh, it's a long reflection and uh, I really thank George Schultz so much because when I arrived at Stanford, I had no idea how to get this book out of my head and onto paper. And he said to me in that first meeting in his Hoover office, just tell a story. He said, that's what Ronald Reagan always did and he got his point across. So just tell a story and that's what I did and I'm exceedingly grateful to him. Now, just a few things about what surprised me most, again, as, uh, as these reflections came out and as I got them down on, the pa on paper. By the way, I think it was, uh, in some ways, this year of pandemic has been a tragedy for so many, and I don't want to downplay that at all. But for me, it was a lucky break because I could do nothing else but write during the year. Uh, Stanford was closed down. We weren't allowed to be on campus. I was interacting virtually with students and, and people that I'm mentoring. But honestly, uh, I really had a lot of time to write and uh, spent my time in our spare bedroom banging this thing out. <laughs> in the old days, we used to say banging it out on the typewriter. It was on my little laptop that it, it uh, got written. But, uh, but I was, I think, lucky in that I had a year to really concentrate on it. And, and that was a really, a really good thing. But in going over the story and, and telling it chapter by chapter, I was reflecting also on what surprised me the most. And what surprised me the most at the end of the day, you'll note that there's a certain tension with the Obama administration, with President Obama himself, and with his top leadership in the interagency. And that tension, I think, emerged because the um, the memory of a large scale negotiation on a strategic arms treaty had faded in Washington. It had been 1990, 1991 since we negotiated the START treaty. START entered into force in 1994. We'd had some efforts, of course, to uh, have a START II treaty that President Clinton, uh, in the end of the day, uh, did not take forward for a ratification vote. Uh, so we had had experience, but a several decades earlier. And a lot of that memory of uh, the intensive necessity of delegation work over a long period of time had faded in Washington. And there was a certain expectation that we could just get this thing done, you know, a couple of visits to Geneva, boom, it would be finished. But the fact of the matter was we were trying some, uh, some really new con concepts uh, in this treaty and particularly moving away from the counting rules that we'd used historically. Um, in that case, I'll just remind people of START, for example, we used a counting rule that was developed based on telemetry data. If a missile was tested with 10 warheads uh, as a maximum number as the SS-18 was by the Russians, then we always counted it with 10 warheads. And the telemetry data was important for determining what the count rules were for each of the various uh, types of missiles in, uh, in the START treaty. We decided to move to confirming the number of warheads uh, on the front end of missiles in the new START treaty, and that depended on uh, some very detailed technical procedures in reentry vehicle on-site inspection, including the use of radiation detection equipment. These are technical details, hard to explain, you know, to the Oval Office. Um, you know, some technical details take time, Mr. President, when he wants this treaty done. So you'll see in the book that there is a certain tension. Uh, there were some really rough moments for, for me and my delegation in uh, trying to, to deal with the expectations in Washington and in trying to ensure that we got a treaty that did what we uh, thought it needed to do, that is make sure that we had the effective verification measures particularly, but also that we had scoped out uh, all the, the parts and pieces of the treaty in as thoroughgoing a way as possible. So uh, that's the drama I think that's inherent uh, in the book. I will say Sahil that um, one of my friends who has published many books when I was getting ready to uh, you know, sign the contract with Cambria Press. By the way, they've been a great publisher, really enjoyed working with them uh, a lot. They have a series, which is a quick turnaround series uh, that is called, I'm gonna look at, here's the book, by the way. <laughs> it's called the Rapid Communications and Conflict and Security Series. And they specialize in getting books out on a faster turnaround 
which I wanted this book to come out in 2021, if at all possible, because that was going to be the year if New Start were to be extended, it would be the year of New Start extension. And indeed, that's what has happened. So I'm, I'm glad it is coming out this spring. But one of my friends advised me, he said, hang on to the film rights. And I just started laughing because I said, a negotiation is like watching grass grow. I cannot imagine it being a thriller in a Netflix series. No way. It is kind of dull, to tell you the truth, although I guess my fights with the White House were, were kind of interesting. But uh, normally speaking, uh, yeah, doing a big negotiation like this, I always say it's not rocket science. Anybody who has teenagers or two-year-olds knows how to negotiate. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it is a bit like watching grass grow because of all the detailed, detailed technical work that has to go into making a treaty. And although the New START Treaty is not nearly as long as START, it's about half the length of, of the START Treaty, nevertheless, it runs to several hundred pages. So that detailed work uh, takes time and it takes effort. And as uh, my good colleague, James Timby says, many of you know James Timby, one of our most senior and well-respected experts on arms control matters. He says, uh, uh, nuclear treaties are uh, the result of people on a mission. And they, uh, as he says, have been working hard on that mission to get, uh, to get the treaty done. So I think New START was the result of people on a mission. I think we did a good job to get it done in one year's time. I wanted to give credit to, to my Russian counterparts who had absolutely the same tasking we did, that is to move quickly to get START replaced. Uh, it was going out of force in December of 2000. Nine And so President uh, Obama and President Medvedev at the time in their initial instructions to the negotiators said, you need to work fast to replace START. And so honestly, I think we were both working to the same pace. It was a very intensive pace. And I have the greatest, greatest respect for my, uh, my Russian counterparts. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Sahil. I'm looking forward to everybody's questions and uh, comments if they have any. Thank you so much. Well, you know, I'm going to kick off the Q and A. Um, we have a lot of questions that have been submitted beforehand. If anyone else would like to drop additional questions into the Q and A function, please um, feel free to do so. But um, you know, my question is based on the fact that our field is increasingly attempting to tackle diversity, equity, and inclusion issues this year. When I read your book, it felt like it was a tale of two negotiations you negotiating not only a nuclear arms treaty and being the first woman to ever lead such an effort, but also rather delicately negotiating, being able to claim more and more space and agency and, and respect from your counterparts and colleagues. And I was hoping that you might be able to share with the audience a story or two or some reflections on you know, where you think there have been improvements where we still need a lot more improvement and you know what what your personal takeaways are from the specific experience of, of negotiating the treaty while being a minority in the room sorry about that i will say that um i expected uh the russian attitude because uh you know the russians are well-known misogynists, there's no question there. I have to say after years and years and years of working with uh, the uh, Soviet Union and then with the Russian Federation, uh, in some ways, uh, Russian experts treat me as one of the guys. Uh, so uh, as in terms of being an expert on nuclear forces, on nuclear arms control issues, I think they are a bit gender blind in that uh, context. But what they were not ready for, I think immediately anyway, was having me as chief negotiator on the other side of the table. And that took some time to work through. I recount those stories uh, in, in the book. I will say that uh, I was lucky uh, that I knew my counterpart, Anatoly Antonov, who was currently the Russian ambassador to the United States, now back in Moscow for consultations, uh, but I hope we'll be returning to Washington soon. Uh, he and I had gotten to know each other because I was the uh, director of the Carnegie Moscow Center for the three years immediately preceding 
the start of the negotiation. So he would he came and spoke at the Carnegie Moscow Center a couple of times. Uh, we had an ongoing seminar on arms control matters that I chaired, and he was kind enough to come come and speak several times. From time to time, we'd get together and have lunch and, and chat about things. So we had an acquaintanceship that I think served us well, because oftentimes when a negotiation starts, if the chief negotiators don't know each other, there's a kind of kabuki dance that goes on for a certain period of time as they figure each other out. And of course, in any negotiation, you're always trying to get the better of your counterpart and a lot of games playing goes on. So that's part of that kabuki dance, figuring out where the, where the soft spots are, where you can get at somebody. But Anatoly and I, I think, knew each other. We had this acquaintanceship and I think we had some mutual respect as well because we knew each other as having a degree of expertise uh, in the arena. So that, that, that was a good thing. But like I said, they didn't expect necessarily to have a woman as the chief negotiator on the other side. So that did cause uh, some episodes that we had, had to get through. What surprised me more, honestly, uh, was my own delegation because I have a pretty, um, I would say even temper, people who know me, who know me from being native BSG, you know, I rarely lose my temper, hardly ever, in fact. Uh, but the men on my delegation were getting very antsy. They said, you know, the Russians, they want to, you know, they're going to need to respect you. You need to pound the table. You need, you need to show some temper. You need to yell at them some. I was doing my reasonable thing, you know, reading talking points, talking about the missile offense defense relationship and going on and on and on in a very, uh, I would say, perhaps too professorial tone. I will be a little self-critical here, but the men in my delegation wanted to see some temper. So one day I just decided to throw a temper tantrum and I brought my hand down on the table and I yelled at the top of my lungs. This was during a plenary session at the Russian mission. I brought my hand down on the table and yelled, this treaty is about limiting strategic offensive forces. It is not about limiting missile defenses. And indeed, we were lucky because Presidents Obama and Medvedev had agreed early on in London that the treaty would be about limiting strategic offensive forces. And that was a good thing because the Russians kept trying to shove limits on missile defenses into the treaty. But uh, that was not our original instruction from the presidents. And I was able to repeat that again and again and again during the course of the negotiations. On this occasion, I lost my temper, turned bright red, people told me afterwards. And when we got back to the US mission, the uh, men on my delegation were delighted. They were really happy that I'd been able to, to throw a temper tantrum. And uh, I've reflected on that afterwards. You know, really, men have various negotiating styles. Sometimes uh, they are famously histrionic. They throw temper tantrums, they shout, whatever they do. Others are much more measured. And I don't think people ask the measured types to throw a temper tantrum necessarily. So in my case, it was important and I did it. Um, I didn't have to do it um, often. In fact, I only threw one other temper tantrum in the course of the negotiations, which was over some uh, Russian backsliding from some agreements that we had already reached. And that was a very, very difficult moment in the negotiations. But uh, actually it was only twice as I rec recollect over those, uh, over those 10 months. You know, when I was reading the book, Rose, I was going through the, the end notes at the end and the word tantrum is actually <laughs> in the end notes and it only appears on two pages. So I think your assessment of, of, of it only happening twice is true, but thank you so much for being willing to, to share that story. I'm going to now shift the conversation a bit to a topic that I know that you've spoken recently about, which is emerging technologies, crisis communication, and you know, how we grapple with this new threat environment that we're in. And your book very helpfully um, begins with you working on the US, uh, Soviet, Russian you know, nuclear hotline and an explanation of how that um, influenced your early work in the field. So I would love to bring in Leah Walker, who is a defense technology associate at the Institute for Security and Technology, uh, perhaps one of very few people who is actually on your time zone at the moment. Um, but Leia would like to ask you a question on, on that subject. Thank you, Sahil. And thank you, Rose, for your fantastic discussion of your book. Um, we all very much look forward to reading this and discussing it. I want to ask, since you have had the experience of working on the US-Soviet hotline early in your career, and you've seen the 
U.S. Russian um, relationship evolve, as well as the NATO, the U.S. transatlantic relationship evolve. Do you think that what was your experience in facilitating communications? Do you think that crisis communications have evolved to the point that we need something other than that singular bilateral hotline? How do you see the state of crisis communication given your perch? Excellent question, Leanne. Thank you very, very much. I will say that, in my view, we are at a much different place than we were in 1976-77 uh, when I was working uh, on the hotline. I was actually a, a technical linguist. I wasn't uh, one of the White House linguists who would have translated should President uh, Carter needed to call uh, Secretary Brezhnev at that point. It would have been one of the professional linguists in, in the White House. Who would have done that. But in my case, uh, I was out at Fort Detrick, Maryland, which was the ground station for the Soviet Molnia satellites, which made part of a redundant uh, network, US and, and Soviet satellites that were used uh, to send hotline messages. So I was responsible for a very large uh, Cyrillic teletype machine, and we would send technical messages back and forth to test, test the link on a regular basis during, during the day. That was important. It was an urgently needed step during the Cuban Missile Crisis. It became clear that we did not have adequate communications links. And at the time, uh, Premier Khrushchev and President Kennedy had to, had to really depend on some uh, go-betweens uh, who may or may not have been reliable as history, uh, it, it turns out. As history has told us, uh, they did get the messages across, but it was very much an imperfect system. So I think the hotline was a wonderful innovation and has been used many, many times since. However, in this day and age, and this is why I often say now, well, is it as bad as the Cuban Missile Crisis now or worse? I actually continue to think it's better because there is significant redundancy of communication. Nowadays, uh, people have, uh, mobile phones and they use them. They send text messages to their counterparts. Uh, very informal methods can be used. Of course, the formal methods remain and must be depended on for formal diplomatic communications. But I think we just have uh, a way of communicating now that is, uh, that is naturally redundant and resilient in, in some ways. Uh, and much, much different from the period of, of the Cuban Missile Crisis. That said, I do think we need to think about the future. I'm interested in the work that you are doing. Uh, there's other work that is going on to try to make use of off-the-shelf communications technology to build resiliency and redundancy into hotlines that are available and would be available to leaders you know, across the world globally. So I really support that, uh, that work that's going on and uh, I think that it is extremely useful because in the midst of crisis or, or heaven forbid conflict, we are going to have to have uh, as much resiliency and redundancy as we can build into our communications links. And I think it will be, will be very, very important. So, um, that, so it's a balance. We have, you know, we have some natural resiliency now. Thank you very much to the mobile phone companies that uh, we can send SMS messages even to uh, counterparts across the world. But uh, at the same time, I, we do need to pay attention to the formal methods and procedures and technologies we use uh, as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rose. Um, on staying on the topic, we had a question from Sylvia Mishra, who is a new tech nuclear officer at the ELN and also a doctoral researcher at the Department of Defense Studies at KCL. She asks, in the backdrop of a polycentric world order with complex deterrent relationships, how can the nine nuclear armed countries think about common perspectives and shared vulnerabilities about nuclear weapons to ensure that emerging technologies and their integration should not undermine nuclear stability? Oh, I think uh, the questioner is pointing to one of the issues we have today, and that is we don't have a generalized conversation amongst the states possessing nuclear weapons on these matters. There's very important work that is going on on the second track, uh, track one and a half in some cases to engage, for example, the South Asians. Uh, we have uh, you know, an official process called the P5 process to bring the nuclear weapon states under the NPT together, but that has been a very formalized discussion. It has started to broach topics of strategic stability, nuclear doctrine and policy. I welcome that very, very much. 
but I really believe that it would be uh, healthy to have a kind of routinized uh, discussion of these matters uh, where countries that possess nuclear weapons are getting together on a fairly regular basis and trying to uh, really develop in a sophisticated way a discourse on, uh, on the instabilities and issues that arise from this most dangerous weapons, weapon of mass destruction, nuclear weapons. Uh, but uh, up to this point, we have not had it, and it's difficult to bring everybody to the table. I did, while I was Under Secretary of State uh, for Arms Control and International Security, uh, help to convene what we call the P5 Plus for a couple of sessions. This was the P5 Plus Indian Pakistan to talk about the specific topic of uh, how do we get going on a fissile material cutoff treaty, which is still frozen at the Conference on Disarmament uh, in Geneva, and it was frozen a decade ago. But we were trying to work through how we might uh, get started on such a, such a negotiation. We had several, I would say, um, difficult sessions because this is a group of countries not used to sitting down and talking about these issues together. But it was a start, and I would like to get back to that again and, and to have a more generalized conversation and perhaps, and so I, I endorse the work that people are doing who are on this call to, uh, to really <laughs> propagate that second track or track one and a half. But uh, let's also think about ways that we might transform it into official discussions uh, as well. Fantastic, thank you. I am now gonna take a pair of questions both from young women who are experts on New Star arms control and, and beginning to work uh, in the official arena. So the first question is from Bernadette Stadler, who I believe interviewed you when she was writing her thesis on the role of Track 1.5 and 2 work during the period of the New Start negotiations. And the second is from Asya Shavrova, who is a member of the ELN's YGLN and wrote on New Start while working at Senes in Moscow and is now working at the CTPTO in Vienna. So I'm asking on both of their behalfs. And Bernadette's question is, in the post-Soviet period, arms control seems to have become democratized with civil society organizations more involved at many levels from writing policy papers with new ideas to actually driving the negotiation of new treaties, such as the TPNW. How do these civil society activities impact arms control negotiations? And the second question from Asya, um, you know, in your book, you talk about the intricate dance of presidential summitry. And currently we have in the news talks of a potential presidential summit between Biden and Putin. And Asya would like to know, how do you assess the outlook for future arms control negotiations in terms of both timeline and, and substance? So um, I will turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, to take Bernadette's question first, um, I think it's really valuable, the interplay uh, between uh, track two work and track one and a half work. It, you're right, Bernadette, it has become more vigorous in recent years, I would say. And also I welcome the advent of a younger generation, uh, very involved uh, with young leaders, uh, activities of various kinds, bringing younger experts together from across uh, various countries. And I, I think that's really valuable. I was just uh, looking yesterday to do a lecture on the NATO 2030 process and, and the role that young leaders played in the 2030 process at NATO has also been very important and I think very valuable. So, so I welcome this, this trend. It's, uh, it's, well, it's groundbreaking and uh, we need to be doing more of it. Uh, I will say, I can tell you the experience of the New START negotiations. We had done an enormous amount of work. I uh, mentioned that seminar I was running in Moscow uh, where we, uh, I brought over experts from both sides of the aisle, experts from the Republican Party, from the Democratic Party, to say, you know, we don't know who's going to run, who's going to run the country after the 2008 election, which party is it, let's try to think ahead about what we will need to do to replace the START treaty. And, uh, and so we had a lot of conversations. So my own thinking had been formed very much through those discussions at the Carnegie Moscow Center with Russian experts, with US experts, again, from, from both sides of the political aisle in the United States, so on a bipartisan basis. 
I won't say that's the only influence. It certainly, uh, it certainly influenced my thinking, uh, and, but there were other activities going on as well. I was not back in the United States during those three years leading up to the start of the New START uh, negotiations. So uh, I know that there were a lot of activities going on in the United States as well, and they do have an impact. At the end of the day though, uh, it does, um, <laughs> it is the government that uh, must put the negotiating um, position together and uh, the basic structure of the treaty flows from, from government to government work, of course, but uh, what's possible in the next negotiation? That's, that's I think, what, uh, what outside groups can contribute. Nowadays, there's a lot of thinking going on and this is beginning to move over to Asya's uh, question. There's a lot of thinking going on about what needs to be uh, in the next uh, strategic arms reduction treaty, what the priority should be. A uh, lot of work going on on thinking about how to directly limit warheads. And I think that's extraordinarily important work because the monitoring and verification of warheads has always been the great barrier to uh, limiting them directly because they are such sensitive items and neither the US government nor the Russian government, Soviet government before it was keen to have foreign inspectors poking around in warhead facilities. So, so thinking through how are we going to go about directly limiting warheads in the next treaty has been important work that is very vigorous at the moment uh, in a number of uh, NGO settings. And I really welcome it. I think it's, it's great. And I think it will directly inform uh, the next uh, round of negotiations. So uh, I think it's that realm of possibility that's where uh, track two work and NGO work uh, goes in. And, and sometimes it's not realistic and, and can't turn up in the next treaty, but nevertheless, I think we have to think big uh, about the future. Uh, Asya has asked a big question. Uh, I see different timelines uh, for different, uh, you know, different parts and pieces. I do see uh, a, another, uh, and indeed President Biden and President Putin have said this, that we need to start negotiating on a replacement for the new START treaty. The treaty has been extended for five years, but we can't wait. We've got to get going on uh, its replacement. And so I see a kind of uh, more or less traditional bilateral negotiation going on to replace the new START treaty, taking up a number of issues, including this matter of, of directly limiting warheads, but also having uh, a new limit, lower limit on uh, delivery vehicles and launchers. Again, I think many of the structural aspects of the new START treaty can be carried forward. The success that we've had with reentry vehicle on-site inspection in new START can certainly be carried forward into, the, into a new treaty and, uh, and developed further therein. So that's, that's one timeline. And I frankly think the presidents are gonna have to set a deadline because negotiators will fill the time available. If you give them five years to replace new start, they'll take five years. So the presidents are gonna to have to think of a deadline and figure that out uh, and you know, we'll see. But there's a whole uh, another realm of strategic stability discussions that uh, I think should be uh, wide ranging and consider a number of these new technologies that uh, Sahil has already been referring to, need to talk about uh, the uh, interrelationship between offense and defense and how it's uh, evolving going forward, need to talk about uh, hypersonic glide vehicles and how we're going to place uh, constraints on them, need to talk about uh, other aspects such as uh, uh, redundancy and resilience of, of uh, nuclear command and control. Uh, our uh, NCAs, we are very concerned, uh, may become vulnerable to cyber attacks. And so, you know, these are the kinds of topics I think that should be taken up in a longer discussion in the strategic stability realm. And by the way, uh, a, a discussion that can also involve other players, I would welcome very much uh, the Chinese. I think it's important to engage them at this point on some of these strategic stability topics where they have an equal interest. I can see them being interested, for example, in uh, hypersonic glide vehicles and where that's going to go. Where is uh, the future of space-based assets? What about some new constraints on INF range, ground launched missiles? Is this not going to be important for the Chinese as well as the Russians and the Americans? So, uh, so there are a lot of topics that we can have uh, a longer conversation about in the context of strategic stability talks. And I would really like to see those uh, get underway. Again, intensively though, we've been at kind of desultory, I think in recent years for many months sometimes going without 
strategic stability discussions and then coming together in an episodic way, perhaps for a day or two in Geneva. I think we need to think about building this, this conversation into uh, something that is, uh, is more intensive and, uh, and more frequent than it has been in the past. Absolutely, you know, I, I could not agree more. And watching the long arc of strategic stability talks from 2017 onwards to now has been very interesting. And it was very heartening that the US ambassador to the CD, um, I believe yesterday or the day before in his speech said that the US and Russia are indeed planning on how to flesh out a new round of strategic stability talks, which was, which was great. And speaking of strategy, I do wanna pull out a few questions from the chat. Um, Ilana Betal, who is a senior associate fellow at the ELN, has asked, what was the strategic aim of the administration um, going into the negotiations in the Obama era? And what do you think the strategic aim is now? It's very nice to hear from, uh, from you, Ilana, and uh, thank you for that question. Uh, the strategic aim, uh, again, was uh, straightforward in the Obama era. President Obama was committed to moving toward a world without nuclear weapons. Within a few days of his meeting in London with Medvedev in April of 2009, he gave his famous Prague speech, uh, wherein he talked about moving steadily toward a world without nuclear weapons. He said, in a realistic way, this would not happen in his lifetime. But he meant the New START negotiations to be one of uh, several negotiations that would produce a couple of reduction treaties during his time in office with the goal of, of steadily reducing nuclear weapons uh, during his time in office. As it turns out, that didn't happen. There were a number of reasons for that. One was that the Russians weren't ready to move, <laughs> as it turned out, on that same traje trajectory. They were satisfied with the New START Treaty. And in fact, President Putin, once he resumed office, let it be known very early that he believed that we should not engage another reduction negotiation until the limitations of the New START Treaty were achieved, which happened in February of 2018. Uh, the parties to the treaty were given seven years to achieve the, the uh, limitations of the treaty. Uh, and that uh, the date of 2018 February meant that President Obama was already going to be out of office. So President Putin made it known early on that he wasn't ready to negotiate another, another treaty with President Obama. So that was the reality of the situation, but the goal was this kind of steady march uh, toward reducing and eliminating uh, nuclear weapons uh, with that goal very much in mind. I think today the goal uh, continues to be uh, in the context of the US uh, commitments and obligations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty to achieve disarmament uh, over time. And I think that will be uh, very much reconfirmed by the Biden administration in the context of the upcoming NPT review conference, which I hope will take place this summer. Uh, but um, the, uh, the goal remains the same and uh, therefore uh, there will be uh, a focus on, as I said, I believe in the new treaty, they will work to continue to reduce uh, and eliminate delivery vehicles and launchers, and uh, in this case, directly limiting warheads, but also in a way that would reduce the operationally deployed numbers. We shall see. I'm not uh, speaking, of course, officially for the Biden administration in any way, shape, or form. Uh, this is my view of the matter. Uh, there will be uh, reviews going on, there are reviews going on, sometimes known as the nuclear posture review. They may be bringing different reviews together under this administration to, uh, to figure out where they can go in a new negotiation. But my prediction is uh, uh, the objectives, the strategic goal will be very much the same as in previous strategic arms reduction negotiations. And that is to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons with the view of uh, moving in the direction of fulfilling the uh, disarmament uh, commitments of the NPT. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Excellent. I'm now going to bring in another young leader, uh, Alexandria Maloney, who is an international affairs officer at the Department of Defense and is currently located in Tampa, Florida, um, where my parents actually live and I grew up. So Alexandria is one of our newest members of the YGLN at the ELN. So Alexandria, over to you. 
Ms. Fulton Moliere, this has been a fascinating and enlightening discussion. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your, your knowledge with us. I'm curious if you could share any guidance that you may have on overcoming obstacles or prejudice um, that one may face in the security field. So particularly as a woman and as a person of color, thank you. Thank you so much for that question, Alexandria. And I wanted to give a shout out uh, to my friend and colleague, Bonnie Jenkins, who has started up an organization, you probably know it, uh, WCAPS, which is working this very problem. And I, I really endorse uh, Bonnie's efforts in that regard. I was delighted to see this morning that her confirmation vote is, is now coming up within, within days and definitely hope she'll make it across the finish line. Uh, she'll be taking over, uh, we hope, as Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security in the State Department. I can tell you what worked for me Alexander, uh, I honestly uh, found that it was a hard struggle, and I started my professional life in the late 1970s when, you know, honestly, uh, sadly, girls were still getting chased around desks uh, by their male bosses and, you know, that kind of stuff. I, I can't say it happened to me, but it was more or less, uh, you know, expected that you'd have to deal with, uh, with some of those shenanigans uh, when you went into the workplace. So it's changed a lot, which is good. And uh, things like the Me Too movement in recent years, I think has, has really helped a lot. But I think what we experience now as women, and I can imagine as, as a person of color as well, it's a kind of, it's more like a dog whistle thing, right? You know, people don't appear to listen to you during a meeting. And then the guy next to you says the same thing. And everybody says, oh, that's a great idea. And you say, well, wait a minute, I just said that. Uh, that still happens to me too. <laughs> so what has worked for me over time is first of all, to ensure that I, I know my brief cold. I really know the issues. I really understand what I'm talking about and I can, I can really deal with, uh, with new problems and new questions that come up. Uh, so that's important because being a problem solver and being able to offer uh, fixes, I think really uh, ups anybody's value, but it really helps for a woman to have those kinds of solution, solutions available as well and to be able to offer them up. The other thing that I found really worked uh, a lot over time was to hone my presentation skills to really be able to speak clearly and forcefully and, and not be shy about, about taking the floor. And the third thing I'll say, and this is advice I continually remind myself of as well, but I offer it a lot to younger people, men and women, that is never apologize. Don't start whatever you're saying with, well, I'm not sure I really understand this issue, but immediately people will discount what you're saying if you start out by apologizing. So I, I remind myself, never apologize. And so that's my third piece of advice, but uh, I am delighted you're working now in DO, uh, DOD and, uh, and wish you all Thank the you. best. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alexandria. I wanted to uh, return to the Q&A function where Ambassador John Duncan has um, put two interesting questions. The first is that um, he was told that the US team did a lot of gaming of various scenarios in planning how to approach the negotiations. And if you could comment on that. And second, that you had mentioned the need to use theater in negotiation. You know, with you know, highlighting your, your tantrums earlier and, and really showing that you meant business. And um, he said that he recalls hearing that you switched to speaking in Russian to bridge the divide with the opponent. Um, he says he was in the room next door on a different topic and also was hoping that you could comment on the need to balance these approaches. Yeah, those are, are great, great questions from John. And he also put into the chat uh, that shouting is very necessary occasionally, especially with the Russians. And yes, I can, I can definitely agree with that. Um, it wasn't that I didn't plan necessarily to throw a tantrum during my time at the negotiating table. I just didn't expect mine to do it early. Uh, so in any event, I agree, shouting is necessary at times with anybody, but especially with the Russians. Uh, gaming, I don't remember actually us uh, sitting down and um, you know, playing out scenarios uh, for the negotiations per se, but I will tell you where we did have a very, and it's written about at length uh, in the book, uh, a very 
very good exercise to develop the new uh, verification regime for the new START treaty because we had very clear word from our Navy and our Air Force, that is the US Navy and the US Air Force, that the START inspection regime had uh, posed some significant problems for the operational tempo of uh, the nuclear platforms in both uh, the Navy and the Air Force. And they wanted to see if there were ways to streamline the uh, verification regime in a way that would not uh, lose function. In other words, we needed to have obviously an effective verification regime that assured that we knew that the Russians were remaining in compliance with the treaty. So those two things had to be kept in balance, effective verification, assurance of compliance, and ensuring that the operational tempo of the Air Force and the Navy was, was not so impeded as uh, it had been under START. So in October, after we'd been struggling with this uh, for a while and trying to figure out you know, exactly how to marry up what was in the START Treaty with some new approaches, Ted Warner, who was my very respected uh, representative from the OSD, from the Office of the Secretary of Defense, he came to me and said, look, I want to, we were going back, the plenary session was over, we were going back to Washington to work on Geneva with a small team of experts uh, on the verification protocol working group, and we're just going to hammer this out because we need to figure out you know, how to sustain what, what we have from start that's highly valuable, but then how to, to marry it up with some new approaches so that we address this, this uh, problem with the operational tempo. So they stayed in um, Geneva and really intensively worked this through. And this was a balance of expertise. This was people from the Navy and the Air Force who were weapon system operators. They knew the one set of problems with operational tempo. And there were seasoned inspectors who knew what was needed to ensure we had effective verification. And so they had some pretty difficult debates and discussions, as I understand. I wasn't there. I went back to Washington to work on the larger set of instructions. But uh, they really worked it out. And it, it really ended up being, I think, uh, quite an innovative approach and extremely valuable. The proof has, has of course, been in the implementation of the New START Treaty, which has gone uh, very well indeed. Uh, of course, every implementation uh, effort has some fits and starts, but I think New START has actually gone very, very well uh, throughout the, the life of the treaty. Uh, now, as to your other question and uh, how to, you know, how to work best and most efficiently and effectively, yes, it was lucky that I spoke uh, Russian and that my counterpart speaks English. Most Russian diplomats, in fact, all Russian diplomats in my experience speak very, very good English. Uh, but uh, it really sped things up that we could use a combination of English and, and Russian in our heads of delegation meetings. These were the problem-solving meetings that Anatoly and I convened. We were responsible for ensuring the treaty text was uh, you know, negotiated, but also that we dealt with problems that were being brought to us by uh, the uh, by the teams who were working on various parts and pieces, whether it was inspections, verification, whether it was uh, conversion or elimination, whether it was the notifications, telemetry issues. So uh, our team leaders would bring us problems that they couldn't resolve in the working groups and we'd have to, we'd have to kind of punch our way through them in our heads of delegation meetings. And, and having the ability to speak freely both in Russian and in English, and we always had really good note takers with us who spoke both Russian and English. And we managed, I think, to make a lot of progress in that way. So it was one factor in the speed of these negotiations. Um, and I say in the book that it's really important that there be some Russian speakers on the US delegation because it speeds up understanding. You can listen twice to the consecutive interpretation. You're listening to their presentation in Russian and then you're listening to the English uh, interpretation. And it, so you, you really gain understanding much more quickly in that way. And so I say in the book, it's not important that the head of delegation speak Russian necessarily, but it's good if there are some people on the delegation who speak, uh, speak Russian and, and are very good linguists and understand the terminology and so forth. So I was lucky that I had several delegation members who were very good Russian speakers. And I think that goes for any negotiation, whether you're talking to the Arabs, whether you're talking to the Chinese, I think it's just healthy to have some good linguists on your side of the table. Uh, so you are not wholly dependent on uh, interpretation.
Thank you so much for that. And I, I won't give it away, but in the book, you outline the complications of when Latin was also added into the uh, discussions. Um, so I found that quite funny. And um, I have the same question that my colleague Kasia Kubiak has put into the chat, um, which is a two prong. First, you know, what was the role of Europe in getting to New START? There was a huge European effort that the ELN tried to contribute to um, in trying to mobilize um, you know, people to try to ensure that the treaty was extended um, this year. Uh, but it would be great to know from you the role of Europe in actually negotiating it. And second of all, from Kasia, how can Europeans support you know, the next round of US-Russian arms control negotiations? Again, we kept uh, the NATO allies uh, informed of what was going on in the new start negotiations. I was regularly dropping in uh, to Brussels to, to brief uh, the NATO allies and others on the team were doing so as well. So it was very important to keep them informed of, of progress, I think, going forward. New start as a bilateral uh, strategic arms reduction negotiation between Russia and the United States did not so much directly involve uh, NATO allies in uh, helping to, to craft the negotiating positions uh, by any means. But um, historically, there has been a role for the NATO allies very directly the, in negotiation of the INF Treaty originally back in the 1980s, for example, was very directly coordinated uh, with the NATO allies, sure that the negotiating position was acceptable to all allies and, and, and crafted uh, with that in mind. So same with, of course, the Conventional Arms Control Treaty, CFE, for example. So I think it depends. I do see a role, and this gets to, uh, to Katharina's uh, comment and question. I mentioned earlier that I think the next uh, round of negotiations is going to have to focus on directly limiting warheads. And I agree with the approach that President Trump took in putting on the table and getting Putin to agree to it, a freeze on all warheads. Now a freeze is a gesture, of course, a unilateral gesture, but I thought it was important that the Trump administration set that precedent down. And now of course the Russians have backed away from it, but nevertheless, the precedent is there and the focus on all warheads I think is important. Therefore, in the next round of negotiations, I think the allies are going to have to be involved in helping to think through how we might constrain all nuclear warheads, including those that are part of the NATO nuclear mission. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, with that in mind, uh, I welcome work that's going on to look at what monitoring and verification uh, might involve to begin to get the allies thinking about what kinds of responsibilities they might have in a, in a monitoring and verification regime. There's a lot of work that's been going on through the IPNDV, the Initiative for Nuclear Disarmament Verification. Really good work there. Uh, there's the so-called quad uh, experiments uh, that uh, involve the UK, US, Norway, and Sweden. There's a lot of work going on, and I think this is really valuable because, uh, to my mind, the NATO European allies need to be thinking now about what role they will play uh, in this next round as uh, the US and Russia begin to think about directly limiting warheads. Fantastic. And speaking of NATO, I would love to bring on screen the manager of our and, and the convener of our Younger Generation Leadership Network and um, my peer of policy fellow, Julia uh, Berghofer, who is going to be um, coming in from Germany. So I've just um, added her to the screen. Thank you, uh, especially for sharing your experiences on the challenge of working in this field uh, as a woman. My question is about NATO and arms control. So in 2019, the Secretary General stated that arms control is a NATO's DNA. However, it seems like NATO still needs to increase the emphasis it places on arms control, both in its activities as well as resourcing. And equally, the extent to which member states are prioritizing arms control varies significantly across the NATO 30. On the level of the nations, how well do you believe is the alliance equipped today to deal with these divergent views? 
and with regards to the institutional level, what do you think is the likelihood that NATO pushes arms control higher on its agenda in this time of intense West-Russia relations, um, including, for example, through a stronger commitment to arms control um, in the new strategic concept and in a possible summit declaration? Thank you. I do. Uh applaud the work that's going on at NATO. It had already begun um, when I was Deputy Secretary General. Um, I noted a real sea change, frankly, in the attitude of the European NATO allies uh, from the time when I was under secretary, when frankly, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, active interest uh, in engaging on nuclear arms control issues. And uh, in fact, oftentimes I'd hear, well, you know, this is a topic that our publics are very, very uh, nervous about, and we don't like to bring it up very much. We don't like to talk about it very much. So I got that kind of pushback when I would be trying to talk about nuclear arms control at, at NATO. But it's changed. We have had a sea change at NATO in recent years, and there is a lot of interest among the allies in talking not only about nuclear arms control matters, but also nuclear nonproliferation and conventional arms control uh, development of possibly some new directions there as well. And I applaud that very much. I think it will be easier now. Uh, it's no secret that the Trump administration, they were not particularly big enthusiasts about, uh, about arms control treaties and agreements. So it was a little bit delicate as to what NATO could say uh, during that era. Um, but I think now with the Biden administration and certainly it's interesting, isn't it, the timing here we're going to have a G7 meeting in Cornwall. We're going to have a NATO summit on the 14th of June. And apparently soon after that, within a day or two, we're going to have uh, Biden getting together with Putin. So I think that it will be important to send a strong message uh, from the NATO uh, summit uh, about uh, where we're, we're going on arms control, what, what we should be thinking about in that regard. Again, I have no insider knowledge about what's coming up in the summit declaration. But I think it will be, first of all, an easier thing to negotiate perhaps than the, a couple of years important to send a signal into the uh, Biden-Putin summit about NATO's interest in this regard and, uh, and willingness to be engaged as well. So um, I, see, uh, I see a kind of a good era coming up as long as, as I said in my previous answer, as long as uh, the NATO allies will be willing to take uh, up some of the hard work that will be necessary to develop uh, these uh, new monitoring techniques for warheads, uh, all the necessary technical details for putting uh, constraints on these objects in these sensitive facilities. I understand it will be complicated and difficult. It will be complicated and difficult for everybody, but I think it will be important for NATO countries to be, to be fully engaged uh, in thinking through what will be needed uh, to directly limit warheads in, in a new treaty. Fantastic. And as a follow-up to Yulia's question, my colleague, who is also an ELM policy fellow, Katerina Kurtisova, has asked, building on your earlier remarks about the importance of US-Russia crisis communication, I have a question concerning lines of communication between Russia and NATO. In your opinion, what prospects are there for purposeful military-to-military -military dialogue to increase predictability and reduce the risk of inadvertent military escalation? Sorry, I'm not doing too well with the mute button this morning. Um, it uh, is already something that NATO is, is caring about, that is military-to-military -military communication. Uh, there are lines of communication open uh, between, obviously, the top military commanders, uh, General Gerasimov and Sakur, uh, also the uh, chairman of the military committee. So I do think that uh, these kinds of communications are important. I, for one, would, would welcome, you know, we have this kind of, uh, thinking about the Syria example, we have this kind of multi-level system of uh, communications going on. Uh, we have, of course, the top military commanders. We have uh, at the level of uh, what I would call in the Department of State, the undersecretary level. So that's the, the three-star level we have in the military uh, communications links going on. And then on a day in day out basis, there is established also uh, a way to deconflict and ensure that uh, the actions and operations going on in Syria do not end up 
leading to crisis uh, between the United States and Russia or, be, or with uh, the Turks, for example. There are several of these hotline arrangements going on in, in Syria, and I welcome them. And I've been thinking for a long time that perhaps this is something that should be considered uh, in the NATO setting and particularly in areas where NATO and Russia are operating in very close proximity, such as the Baltic Sea. I have to say to this point, uh, the NATO allies have not been willing to go in that direction at the time of the invasion of Crimea. Uh, they cut off all um, military contacts at, a, at lower levels particularly, uh, but anything that was uh, couched as uh, business as usual stopped at the time of the Crimea invasion. There were good reasons for that, but I think today it's time to take a new look at this because of the possibility of, of crisis uh, emerging Emerging and the danger of perhaps inadvertent escalation. So it's something that I would like to see NATO uh, and the Russian Federation looking at. We have to ask the Russians if they'll be willing. They're the ones who have shut down the NATO-Russia Council, which I very much regret. There hasn't been a NATO-Russia Council meeting since I was at NATO, and that's going on to two years ago at this point. So uh, it's, uh, to, to my mind, uh, that is not a good development. Thank you for that. And there, there are uh, so many great questions in the chat, and I really apologize to not getting to all of them. But Amy Nelson has put into the chat, how will we ever effectively manage Russian concerns over US missile defenses? Is this doomed to be a perpetual thorn in the side of any US negotiator? Well, I always smile at this. I wonder myself, honestly, because, uh, you know, <laughs> US missile defenses are very limited, and the Russians have uh, full transparency into our program. So, you know, of course they always say, well, it's limited today, but what about tomorrow? What are you gonna do tomorrow? Um, so yes, all these are good questions, but I think in a way uh, they would be assured they'd have strategic warning if the United States ever decided to go for broke for another kind of uh, full up national defense system on the, on the, um, order of, of what Reagan was proposing with the Star Wars program, there'd be plenty of strategic warning of that. So it is a puzzling uh, matter. It has been for me many years, a puzzling matter, but um, nevertheless, it's one that we do have to take account of and we do have to work on. I've been actually glad recently that the Russians have uh, acknowledged, uh, at least in some of the second track meetings that I've been involved in, they've acknowledged the value of confidence building in this realm. Always before they they just insist, you know, ah, you know, we don't want any of your confidence building and transparency measures. What we want are direct limits on missile defenses, which the United States was just not going to go for, uh, politically impossible uh, for the United States. So. Uh, they seem now more interested in confidence building uh, and transparency measures, exchanges of information. I think that's very valuable, number one. Number two, uh, they seem uh, very confident in the capabilities of their strategic offensive forces. President Putin himself has mentioned repeatedly that some of the new kinds that are out there, uh, the nuclear propelled torpedo, for example, uh, really ensures that uh, the Russians have the capability to, uh, you know, defeat any missile defenses. So there seems to be a higher level of confidence on the Russian side uh, as well in the capabilities uh, of their strategic offensive forces. Again, puzzling to me because for decades, the Russians have poured money into uh, the uh, penetration capability of their ICBM force and their SLBM force. They are very capable ballistic missiles with all the penetration aids that the Russians have, have incorporated into them. So. You know, why this lack of confidence, I've always scratched my head about, but it's there now with the new kinds that are out there, there seems to be a, a level of confidence in the strategic offensive forces. But there's one other point I'd just like to put on the table, and I do think it's important now for the United States also to be talking to the Russians about their very capable missile defenses that they are developing. They've just modernized the Moscow ABM system, very capable uh, systems there. Uh, again, not proposing that they're somehow going to, to leap to uh, a nationwide defense system from the Moscow uh, ABM system, but nevertheless, some very capable new technologies put into place there. Systems like the S-500 and the S-400, S-500 particularly having some capabilities against intercontinental range systems. We should be talking to them too about what they're doing with their missile defenses and what their expectations are 
for the future. So I'd like to see this become more of a two-way discussion going forward, uh, rather than always the United States, you know, answering the questions of the Russians. So it should be a two-way discussion. And speaking of technologies, Melissa Hannum has asked in the chat, what technologies do you see as most promising for verification of, of new treaties? Oh, wow. Melissa came and talked to my uh, class at Stanford winter to quarter where I was talking about uh, verification and monitoring technologies for future arms control treaties and agreements, not only nuclear ones, and she did an absolutely great job based on the work that she's been doing over, over the years on the North Korean program. So I want to thank you again publicly, Melissa, for that. Um, I really think there's a lot of opportunity out there. I'm particularly interested in the advent of, uh, of ubiquitous uh, uh, earth monitoring. The fact that we now have global, practically global coverage from these, uh, these commercial satellite constellations that are going up, and that's only going to get uh, better as time goes on with uh, the, also the possibility of, of uh, uh, you know, not only visual imaging, but other kinds of uh, phenomenology, um, infrared being a great example and having more opportunity to, to really uh, image uh, the surface of the earth in, in various ways. I'm interested in particular how that will influence our future thinking about national technical means, what constitutes national technical means. Uh, traditionally, these have been satellites, aircraft, big radars, et cetera, that are owned by national governments. But when we have this kind of ubiquitous sensing capability, imaging capability, do we want to somehow bring that uh, into the concept of national technical means? And that, of course, will be a matter for uh, a good deal of discussion and negotiation, I am sure. But that basic notion of non-interference with national technical means carried forward in this way with more ubiquitous sensors, I would think would be comforting to somebody like the Chinese who do not want to have boots on the ground. They don't want to have on-site inspectors. So if they're willing to permit more ubiquitous uh, sensing in the guise of national technical means and non-interference with national technical means, they can avoid some on-site inspection. Not all, but they can avoid some on-site inspection. And I think that would be welcome to a number of countries, the, the Russians included. Fantastic. And, you know, speaking of your of your students, I would love to ask a question um, about, you know, what has been so most inspiring to you, um, you know, being at Stanford and being in, in, in your new teaching role. Um, it was a great pleasure to be able to meet some of your students when you hosted um, Dr. Lucina Zerbo and I to talk about the CTBT a few months ago. And I know that Stanford is such an innovative and exciting place that really brings together both science and policy. And it would be great to hear from you um, what has been you know, exciting and inspiring to be exposed through in, in your new setting. <laughs> well, I have to stress that word innovation. I turned my students loose after doing uh, a number of introductory lectures and I had great guests like Melissa come in and talk to them about all aspects of the various arms control regimes, not only the nuclear ones, but also the C CWC, the BWC, the CTBT as Dr. Zerbo came, talked about the CTBTO. Uh, so we tried to cover as many of the big regimes as we could and then talk about what the various tools are that are available uh, including some of these new technologies and, uh, and new tools that might be available to inspectors. And then I turned them loose and I had no idea what the output was going to be in terms of their final projects, but they were terrific. And there were some really good ideas there for thinking through uh, how to engage, uh, for example, the North Koreans uh, in, a, in a better way and get them involved in a negotiation. That was one area. There was thinking about what do we do uh, if we're going to think about this wider uh, concept of national technical means? What do we do about the fact that so many of these commercial constellations are, are essentially US controlled or controlled by US companies and there's uneven ownership of them across the world? So, so what are we gonna do about that in terms of uh, sharing equally in, in these assets? So really good ideas. I was really thrilled uh, with the work that they did. And some of them are carrying, uh, carrying that work forward with some additional project work. So um, yeah, it was just as you say, Sahil, and you know from, from uh, firsthand, 
a bunch of really smart students at Stanford and they think about putting policy and technology together. So uh, that was a lot of fun for me and very inspiring as well. It's fantastic, fantastic. I am now going to, to close us out, bring on screen um, Lord David Hannay, who um, chaired our New Star Action Group with uh, General Bernard Norlan um, from France. Uh, and you know, we really valued your insight and advice and um, being able to work with the US NGO community to really rally for the extension of the treaty was a, an exciting project to work on. And I'd like to bring Lord Hannay on screen to be able to comment and, and or ask a question. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, yes. I can. Well, thank you very much for that. I wonder if I could ask you uh, just to comment on the latest um, uh, strategic review that the British government's undertaken, and in particular, given the importance you attach to uh, finding a way of capping warheads, what you think of the uh, direction in which British policy seems to be heading of increasing the number of warheads. Uh, some of us here don't think that's perhaps the right direction to be going in, but I'd like to hear your comment. And could you say whether you think that uh, of the two um, treaties which lapsed during the Trump period, uh, the in intermediate one and the open skies, is there anything to be salvaged from them at all or has the show moved on? Thank you very much, Lord Hannay, and it's an honor to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, well, with regard uh, to the, uh, the British Review, uh, of course, you know, that's very much London's business, but I will say what I've said also to the UK government when I was asked, uh, I said, please stay open-minded uh, to what uh, the Nuclear Posture Review will produce in the United States, or as I mentioned earlier, it may be a combined review with missile defense and, and other aspects. But I said, uh, please stay mindful of, 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 of this review process in the United States, uh, and uh, it may lead you to some additional thinking in this area. As I understand, this is a ceiling. Uh, they've said they're not necessarily going to build up to this level. So I do hope that the UK government will take into account uh, the Biden administration's approach and, and their uh, results from their review process. Uh, on the other questions that you have, uh, I do think, frankly, for me, it's rather amusing to see that the Russians now seem to miss the INF Treaty. Uh, they are talking in various ways, including uh, President Putin himself, about uh, placing some new constraints on INF range missiles. I was very glad to see the way in which President Putin put on the table a, uh, I call it a refreshed offer for a moratorium in Europe. And in that refreshed offer, they actually put the 9M729 missile on the table. The Russians have never acknowledged that that missile flies to intermediate ranges, but uh, Putin said without uh, confirming or denying its, uh, its range that uh, he would be willing to remove all 9M729 missiles from European Russia and put in place a verification regime to monitor uh, that uh, removal. Of course, the goal is to keep new ground-launched cruise missiles conventionally armed that the United States is, is building out of Europe. Uh, of course, that, uh, that goal is there. But I do think it's an interesting uh, offer and that uh, we should be looking at it very seriously. That of course means that there will be an uptick in intermediate range missiles in Asia. I think the Chinese are going to sit up and take notice of that. Uh, that's one reason why early on I mentioned that I think uh, discussions of constraints on intermediate range ground launch systems in Asia may also be ripe involving not only Russia but also the Chinese, but we will see. That's uh, my my view, they should have an interest in this matter, whether they will or not. Uh, well, that's a question for Beijing to answer in the end of the day. The Open Skies Treaty, I regret uh, very much. Uh, it is not yet fully uh, you know, gone. The Russians have started their, uh, their legislative process to complete their withdrawal from the treaty. It will be a six month process, as I understand. Uh, we will see the Biden administration is reviewing this matter. I do think that there is a vital confidence building 
uh, role that this treaty plays. We have so few military to military contacts now with the Russian Federation. The Open Skies Treaty, if you don't know how it operates, you may be surprised to learn that every Open Skies flight has uh, on it not only uh, the inspectors, but also the inspected party. So if a flight is taking place over Russia, there are Russian military men on those flights and exchanging views with the inspectors, with their counterparts uh, from the NATO countries. So I think it's a valuable, and other partners, by the way, not all signatories of the Open Skies Treaty are, are NATO members. But I do think that uh, it has a vital confidence building role. And so I hope that that will be uh, part of the reasoning for, um, for the Biden administration as, the, as they look at the treaty. We shall see. Uh, it's not a good week for the Open Skies Treaty because of the beginning of this Russian legislative process. Well, Rose, thank you so much. We've covered an enormous amount of ground. Again, for the audience, the new book, Negotiating the New START Treaty, has been released by Cambria Press. I have read it. It is there. It is an incredible uh, personal account, and you know, there are so many uh, hilarious stories, scary stories, um, and very heartening stories as well. Um, and we're so grateful again that you could join us. And thank you once again for your great service in making us all safer and making the world um, you know, a more stable place. So thank you so much, Rose. Thank you, Sahil. It's been a great pleasure. And thank you to everyone on this call. Wonderful questions and a really good conversation. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. See you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.